time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longine Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening. This is David Ross. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Ogden Reed, Jr. of the New York Herald Tribune. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Henry Cabot Lodge, Jr., United States Senator from Massachusetts. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. Uh. Mr. Lodge, it's a great pleasure for us to have you tonight on the Longines Chronoscope, sir. Our audience knows you, of course, as the distinguished senator from Massachusetts. And tonight, we'd like to ask you something about uh, General Eisenhower's tactics when he returns here. Now, sir, can you tell us first, can you tell our audience uh, what some of General Eisenhower's plans are when he arrives in the United States? <clears throat> Well, he plans to uh, <coughs> arrive in Washington and then go to Abilene, Kansas, where he makes a speech on the on the 4th of June. On June the 4th, he speaks in Abilene. Mm -hmm. About how many speeches, Senator Lodge, do you think he should and will make? Well, you can't tell that this far ahead. What it's, specific? It's a great mistake to make your plans for the end of the campaign three months ahead. You shouldn't do that. Well, I understand that he's, uh, we heard the rumor that he was going on to Colorado and would probably spend a great deal of June in Colorado. That's one of the best kept secrets of the whole campaign. I announced it to 6,000 people in Denver, and it never got printed in the East at all. <laughs> Senator <laughs> Lodge, what, excuse me, uh, what subjects do you think General Eisenhower ought to deal with, hard-hitting subjects, in these speeches that he will make? What do you think, in short, the people in this country would like to know that they are not clear on as yet? Well, I think people are pretty clear about Eisenhower. I think most of the talk about not being clear comes from the campaign managers of his opponents. And I think one way not to run a campaign is to run it so as to please your opponent's campaign managers. Uh, we had a big victory in Massachusetts <coughs> the other day, and a lot of people voted for Eisenhower. In fact, he ran very strong in the Democratic primary. And some of the task campaign, campaign managers said it was immoral that we wanted to get Democrats and independents to vote for Eisenhower. Well, inasmuch as the Republicans only have 31% of the vote, how are you going to win if you don't accept the Democrats and the Independents? Are you going to vote the cats and the dogs and the cows? I don't know. <laughs> now, uh, Senator, there's been uh, considerable thought and discussion about the tactics that uh, General Eisenhower would use and about his being warned to say, say nothing or his being warned to be forthright. Now, do you expect him to be forthright in his answers to questions when he returns here? Well, there's no question about it. He isn't going to have any tactics. Uh, uh, we, we've, we've never had any tactics in this campaign. We feel he's the most popular man. We feel he's the best qualified man. He's the man everybody wants. And our sole job is to see that that demand is translated into delegates. Let's take... Uh, I think he's... Of course, he's going to be forthright. He always has been. He's going to be just as forthright in dealing with domestic questions and political questions as he has been dealing with military and foreign questions. There isn't any doubt about that. You don't think that then that, uh, that he is going to attempt to follow a tactic of saying nothing then? Well, I think it's perfectly ridiculous. I think that is just as ridiculous as the rumor that was put out by his opponents that he was going to stay in uniform until after the convention. Because yeah, it just isn't true. He's going to be in civilian clothes. He's going to be just as free to, to talk as he was as president of Columbia. Well, well, now I, don't, do I don't know why they start all those things when they're obviously fallacious on the face of them, you know. Well, Senator Lodge, on particular... I think it's because there isn't any <coughs> real issue against him, so they're trying to fabricate things. Well, Senator Lodge, for example, on certain questions, it's clear where General Eisenhower stands on the whole subject of socialism. But do you think going from the principle to the particular, he should deal with particular things that are current, such as the steel strike or the Taft-Hartley law? <coughs> Well, I don't think he ought to go into legislation that was enacted. The Taft-Hartley law was enacted, the McNary-Hogan bill, the Bankhead-Jones Act. I don't think he needs to go back because his opponents would like him to say how he would have voted if he had been a senator during the last 15 years. Well, he wasn't a senator, and he wasn't exactly wasting his time either. And I can imagine no greater waste of the public's time than to try to figure out how he would have voted if he'd been a senator all those years. I just think that's, that's a mistake. Let's, let's take this. I think issues that involve the future 
Uh, those are, that's something, that's something else again. The specific issue of uh, Tidelands Oil, I believe he took a specific position on that in the last week, did he not? In a letter that was released in Texas? I'm not sure. Well, as I, I believe it was a published report by Eisenhower's forces in Texas, Jack Porter, that uh, they'd received a letter from Eisenhower which seemed to uh, indicate, or they interpreted it, that he had taken uh, the Texas and California position for states' rights on Tidelands oil. Uh, did you understand that that way, sir? No, I didn't understand it quite that way. I, I, I think there were some other thoughts in the letter that uh, he wrote to Jack Porter. I see. Wasn't quite as you think it as would that. you think it would be a mistake then to take it as a uh, that Eisenhower has endorsed the Texas position on Tidelands. I didn't say that. I said his letter to Jack Porter was not as simple and as brief as you would uh, indicate. I see. I think there were some other thoughts in there about oil. Do you feel, Senator Lodge, and when General Eisenhower comes back, he will make very clear his opposition to the administration's foreign policy in certain areas? Uh, I can think offhand, particularly of the administration's policy or lack of policy, which would be more accurate with regard to China. Well, I don't know what he's going to say. He's going to make up his own mind himself. He doesn't have to have me to do that. Uh, I know that he's always been critical of the administration's foreign policy. <laughs> that as far back as Potsdam, he told the president that we should make no concessions to the Russians to get them into the war against Japan, and that if his advice had been followed, we wouldn't have had the mistakes at Yalta, and Poland would not have been sold down the river, and China would have been saved instead of betrayed. I know all that. I don't know what he's going to say. He's, he's a man who's well able to make up his mind for himself. Uh, Senator, let's come back just a moment to your point about uh, it's perhaps being immoral to attract Democrats into the Republican Party. It's not party. my point. <laughs> well, That's Dave Ingalls' <laughs> point. Well, my point is that you can't possibly win by going around shaking hands with yourself all the time. Are you, You've uh, got to attract Democrats and independents. Right. Are you concerned, sir, about the fact that uh, a great many New Dealers are apparently supporting General Eisenhower? Will you name one? Well, I don't know particularly. I don't happen to know any, but I mean, will you name one? Well, uh, is, it fact, is it true that any, any New Dealers in Massachusetts are supporting the general? I don't know. I'm asking you to name one. I don't happen to know. A great many Democrats vote. Well, I, let's see. I, I'll attempt to name one. Mr. Norman Thomas, I believe. I didn't know that he was. Leader. I believe he expressed himself on this show two or three weeks ago. Well, there may be some socialists supporting some of the other candidates, for all I know. We have millions and millions of supporters. It isn't an exclusive club. We welcome everybody. I see. That's the point, I mean, that I'm trying to make is that you, as a Republican leader, you are quite uh, anxious to get re Democrats and even New Dealers to vote for the general if necessary. I or say if they that find it's him attractive. a simple problem in arithmetic that if every Republican came out to vote, it would only be 31% of the vote. Well, you just can't win with 31%. You've got to augment it. Well, you've got to get Democrats or independents. Where else can you go? Following Eisenhower is very sweeping, I think you can say, <coughs> sweeping victory in Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, and other states recently. Do you think his chances for winning on the first ballot are pretty good at this point? It's, it's impossible to tell about the ballot this time, uh, this far ahead. You can't tell whether it's the first or the second or the third or the fourth. It's impossible to tell. Do you have, uh, let me ask you this, as his principal campaign manager, or as one of his campaign managers, have you been satisfied with the campaign to date, sir? Has it gone along the lines? Have there been any surprises for you? Well, I'm the fellow who's been running it, and, and, and uh, uh, I don't suppose anybody is ever satisfied with what he does. I, I, uh, I don't think any man feels he's done his best work all the time. <coughs> I've had some disappointments, of course. What are your plans, Senator Lodge, once General Eisenhower is nominated? Well, I'm a candidate for re-election to the United States Senate in Massachusetts. You would not want to be his campaign manager, for example? Well, I don't know whether I'd want to be. I, I don't know. I, uh, I know it's hard for you to understand this, but I look up to that convention. I don't look much beyond it. <laughs> well, now, do you uh, have any... There's so much to do between now and the convention that there isn't any time to speculate about what happens after the convention. Have you any announced opposition in Massachusetts as yet? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Is a young Mr. Kennedy uh, right. going to be your opponent there? He's announced, yes. He's already announced. Mm -hmm. Do you expect to have any... Is there any opposition in the Republican primary? No, not yet, no. And you don't expect any? I don't know of any. Okay. But I know the m politics is an eternal mystery and it's full of surprises. That's what makes it interesting. Now, uh, w would you care to predict for us, sir, as to... Uh, uh, how many votes uh, General Eisenhower will have by uh, June the 20th? I've never made a prediction in my life. Uh, uh, I say that we're ahead now, 
I say that the um, polls that are printed in the papers are incomplete, necessarily so, because they don't know the inwardness of all these situations the way I do. Uh, so the polls in the papers are misleading. Where do you, how many committed delegates do you claim for the general election? I'm not claiming anything numerically at all at any time. Would you say that the Taft forces have been stopped and that from here on in they're not going to gain substantially? Well, when, uh, when uh, the Ohio primary is held, Senator Taft is going to make some gains, but that is something that has been anticipated. Well, I'm talking now in terms of proportions. He, I don't think uh, he's going to make any gains uh, in, the, in the true sense. Out, he's going to get his, his hard core of votes that we've all known that he's had but he isn't going to gain anything outside of that. Senator, as a, as a final question, sir, and speaking as a Republican leader, do you think that there will be any uh, really serious wounds in the Republican Party as a result of this coming convention? Do you expect to see a united party after the convention, whoever gets yes, the nomination? I, I do at the present time. I certainly do, and I certainly hope so. Uh, I think Eisenhower is going to be nominated. I think Eisenhower appeals to all elements in the Republican Party, all factions, all groups. He showed it in New Hampshire. He showed it in New Jersey, Massachusetts, everywhere. They've had a chance to express themselves. Well, Senator, I'm sure that our audience very much appreciates your views tonight, and thank you very much for being with us, sir. Okay. The editorial board for this edition of the Laurentine Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Ogden Reed, Jr. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Henry Cabot Lodge, Jr., United States Senator from Massachusetts. Here are views of the famous mobile gas economy run, timed by Lon Jean as official watch for the American Automobile Association. We were happy to cooperate because it's the type of event of which uh, we approve. An open contest, fair to all, where the results, win or lose, are made public. Our congratulations to Mobile Gas. And do you know that it was uh, in just such open competitions that Longines became, in fact, the world's most honored watch? Yes, in World's Fair's competition, the results, win or lose, are published. And here, Longines watches have won highest honors wherever entered. A total of 10 World's Fair grand prizes and 28 gold medal awards. Yes, and in observatory accuracy contests, too. Longines watches have won innumerable honors for accuracy at all the great national observatories. Now, if you wish to own just about the finest watch made anywhere in the world, your choice might well be Longines, the world's most honored watch. As a gift for any important occasion or for yourself, no other name on a watch means so much as Longines, the world's most honored watch premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. This is David Ross, speaking for your regular host, Frank Knight, inviting you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at the same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour. Broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines, sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem. Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. This is the CBS television.